Praise the Lord. And uh, it's been good uh, seeking the Lord, flowing with the Lord. And uh, we have been uh, talking about uh, the end times. So let's uh, go to God in prayer as you consider the end times today. Father, we just thank you for your grace, your mercy. We know, Lord, that we have to continue to relook at these things that come to pass in the end times, that our minds will be clear as to all the events that are to take place, especially, Father, as we are a part of these events from the spiritual dimension. We play a part, Father, in the protection of your people, salvation of your people, and of your chosen people, Father, and all that you want to do. Thank you, Father, that we will set the pace in the spiritual dimension, work with your angels, the archangels, and all the spirit beings who are organizing this whole planet and all the end time and all the nations for its various destiny. Help us to find our place so that we can do all that you want us to do and establish your kingdom on earth as it is established in the heavens above. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Father. Glorify Jesus. And we give you all the glory, worship, and honor in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Now, we are really looking at the end times, uh, especially in the light of some of the prophecies that uh, Pastor David has brought forward. And uh, we are to be very clear where we stand in the end times and, uh, and know what to expect and also the role that we will play from the spiritual dimension. When we talk about end times, uh, let it be very clear in our heart and our mind that there is one particular point in the end time that I believe is important to God, to Jesus, to, uh, to the destiny of Israel and the Jews. And that is mentioned by Jesus and even in most of the prophecies. And uh, so we want to look from one demarcation point because the end time prophecy, there's so many. There's Matthew 24, there's uh, Paul in the book of uh, Thessalonians, Timothy, uh, Daniel's prophecy, book of Revelations. And we put all of them together. There's one prime area that we will work backwards from. And uh, let's take, uh, let's say, this um, uh, table to symbolize uh, the what we call the abomination of desolation. That's the demarcation point that's very important in the end times. In the book of Matthew, Jesus started with that. In the book of Matthew, <clears throat> we see in Matthew chapter 24 that even Jesus uh, talks about it. Thus, uh, we know that it is important. In chapter 24, verse 15. Uh, before that, Jesus talked about the gospel, the kingdom being preached throughout all the earth, up to verse 14. Then he mentioned one demarcation point. These are points that cannot, uh, cannot be prevented, but has to occur. In chapter 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by, or by Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and especially those in Israel. So there's one point that Jesus says, okay, this, this marks an important time in the abomination desolation. And what took place is that there is a temple, and there's a Jewish temple, and in the abomination of desolation described in Daniel, that uh, the Jewish sacrifice are normally sacrificed in their temple. And in the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist comes and makes abominations in the very place where the Jews sacrifice. So that special time is called abomination of desolation. And um, that, since Jesus quoted Daniel, let's look at the book of Daniel. In uh, Daniel, we see here, where the abomination is mentioned, <clears throat> it has to do with the weeks in chapter 9. In chapter 9. And Daniel was figuring out when the Jews will go back to their own land. Daniel was a, cap uh, was a captive during the time of the destruction of Jerusalem under King Nebuchadnezzar. And he was studying the prophecies of uh, Jeremiah. And in chapter 9, verse 24, 70 years are determined for your people and for your holy city uh, to finish a transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision, prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. 
and all this were, was in the past. Uh, in my book, uh, Foundational Series, Volume 14, I mentioned when the 70 years starts uh, in the time of Daniel. It says, from the going out of the command to rebuild, uh, count 70 uh, years. And it has been expanded in Daniel's time, it was 25. It tells you when the 70 years began, and that is in our past. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two. Seven plus sixty-two. So that's all together sixty-nine weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And that was true. Verse 25 has been fulfilled from the time of the going forth of the command. And, and it was revealed to Daniel that each week represents seven years. Uh, and so 70 years will be 70 times 7. 69 will be 69 times 7. Uh, and so there's a 400 over odd years. We come from the time in Daniel he was in the Babylonian kingdom. Now, I'm going to take some uh, demarcation points. And uh, uh, let's illustrate with these little uh, fluffy things. And okay, demarcation point. And uh, so the demarcation point uh, at this place, uh, let's say... Uh, the Babylonian kingdom. And then we have, uh, after that was the Middle Persian kingdom, Middle Persian empire. And then, uh, let, let's adjust it a little bit further back. And Middle Persian. Then we have the Greek empire. And then we have the Roman empire. There we go. So Daniel was standing somewhere in the Babylonian uh, okay, now let's see. He's under, by now, chapter 9, he's under the Middle Persian. So he's in the Second Empire. And he's looking forward in time to the abomination of desolation. Since we all got these markers. Let's get these cute little markers here. So this is the abomination of desolation. Since the abomination, we put it upside down. Okay. If it stands upside down, praise God. Okay. So abomination, desolation, all things turn upside down. And so Daniel, looking forward to that, and uh, 70 weeks of years. And uh, so at some point, the prediction was told to him that after 7 plus 62 weeks, and so in verse 26, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So something happened at 67 weeks plus 69 weeks. There is a demarcation point that is very important. And that demarcation point will be Jesus. Okay, Jesus we must put. Yes, Jesus. Okay, let's get um, more support. And uh, so that you all can see. Okay, demarcation point, Jesus comes. So, it says that from Daniel's time, from the going out of the command, under Cyrus, which was during the Middle Persian Empire. When the going out, there will be 69 weeks. 7 weeks plus 69 weeks. And so he goes forth and he calculates under the time of the Messiah. And uh, there is Jesus appearing. And then something happened from the time of Jesus in Daniel. Uh, there is one more last week. Remember, 7 weeks plus 69 so, plus 62, 69 weeks. So, there's one last week. That last week, we will demarcate it. So, we're going to use two more of these little things. And uh, so, there's supposed to be the 69 week that reached until Jesus here. And then from that point, which uh, to this point, which is the middle of the week, and then the completion, end of the week. So they're supposed to be, like from here to there, it's supposed to be seven years. Very precise. But something happened. That between the 69 week and the 7 week, something that the prof prophecies did not show clearly, but we now understand there's a big gap. Between the 7 plus 62 to the last week. Which is why the last week has been put forward somewhere forward in time. So this is in the middle of the week, the last seven years, these seven years. So last week plus 69 weeks, all make 70. So something has happened 
from the Babylonian kingdom to the Middle Persian to the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great, then you have the Roman Empire and to Jesus, still under the Roman Empire, that there's a big gap. So there's a gap after Jesus has come and gone to the seventh week. So we are in the middle of this gap and up to now, this gap is nearly 2,000 years. As you know, time, 2,000 years is like two days to God, two minutes or whatever you want to count it. So this is a 2,000 year gap that we are in. And uh, only God knows how long more we have to go before this gap finishes. So that's where, where we are in prophecy. You can see it systematically in, uh, in, in flowing along. And so keep this in mind as we look at this abomination of desolation. So here we are. The abomination of desolation is in the middle of the last week of Daniel. And since we are here, we are in the, it's in the future. In our future. This abomination of desolation is so important that so many events are concentrated around here. And the last week, a lot of concentration of events are in the last week. In fact, most of the book of Revelation cover this part. This last week of Daniel. Now what happened in the last week? Let's look at Daniel chapter 9. It tells us here, that in verse 27, And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, there you have, in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation which is determined is poor on the desolate. This is the abomination of desolation that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. So even Jesus knows prophecy. And Jesus knows this is a big event, abomination or desolation. So what Jesus says is, when we are in the last week of the Jews, if you are living here through what we call the Great Tribulation, the last seven years, if you see that taking place, if you're in Jerusalem, run to the mountains. Something bad is going to happen here. What is the bad thing going to happen? Look at the book of Revelations. All those things in the book of Revelations primarily take place in the last week. Now we will go back to our time afterwards, but you've got to see all these sequence of events. And um, book of Revelations, it tells us several things will take place. Firstly, there is the two witnesses will appear. The moment the last week start, Elijah and what I believe will be uh, Enoch, will come back in this last week to do their work of prophecy. How long will they prophesy in number, uh, Revelation chapter 11? It says here, <coughs> verse 2, But leave out the court which is, uh, we are in Revelation chapter 11 verse 2, Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So apparently, Something is going to happen to Jerusalem. 42 months. 42 months divided by 12 equals to three and a half years. Exactly. So again, three and a half years. The first three and a half years, something is going to happen in Jerusalem. That's why Jerusalem is not the place you want to be in the Great Tribulation. And uh, so here you have the 42 months. And verse 3. I will give my power to my two witnesses they will prophesy 1,260 days. You divide by 360, you also get three and a half years. So God is very specific. A lot of things happen. In this first half of the week, three and a half years, the two witnesses will prophesy 1,260 days. And something is also happening in the city. So that is half of the week. And at the end of their prophecy, uh, they will be killed and they were killed by the beast that came out from the bottomless pit, Apollyon. Uh, and uh, then the earth will make merry and all kinds of things. And after three, day, three and a half days, they will be raptured up, shum, taken up to God. At the same time, as all these things taking place, during the first half, you see the book of Revelation chapter 6. There are the four seals broken. So all the seals that are broken, seal 1, seal 2, seal 3, seal 4, seal, uh, seal 5, uh, seal 6, Seal 7, 
all these seals are broken at the beginning of this last week. So this last week is sealed up. It cannot occur until the seals are broken. And as the seals are broken, the Antichrist is allowed to go back, go out and conquer. So the horse that you see in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, is not Jesus, it's the Antichrist. Antichrist, who will come like the Christ. And he will be like the Messiah to the Jews. And um, the Jews will accept him as a Messiah for the first three and a half years. And he will be like the Savior of the world. And so that's again these three and a half years. And then as he arises, there will be uh, war in verse uh, 3 to 4, a conflict on the earth. There will be famine in verse 5 to 6. There will be death in verse 7 to 8. So you can see one thing follow the other. Then there will be a lot of martyrs. People will die because the Antichrist is given power over the saints for a short time. For this period. And he will especially target the saints of God in the tribulation. That is a reality. Uh, hold your place there. Uh, look at the book of Daniel again. And in this uh, today one, you got to put one finger in Daniel, one finger in Revelations. Uh, the book of Daniel, we look at, uh, firstly, we look at the first couple of chapters of Daniel. Not yet, 11 is too far. And uh, where we want to look at, let's give you the place, uh, chapter, look at chapter 7 first. Chapter 7, in verse 25. When the Antichrist comes, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. That represents three and a half years. Time, times, and half the time. So again, everything happened this last week. Three and a half years. And the saints are given to his hand. Uh, so his dominion over, he killed many of them. According to the book of Revelation, chapter 7, uh, chapter, chapter 6, um, the martyrs, thousands are killed. He targets the saints, and then the sixth seal is broken. A lot of things happen on the whole cosmic things. And uh, there's earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The moon turned into blood. Stars of heaven fell to the earth. Meteorites probably. All kinds of things happen. So there's a great cosmic disturbance. And chapter 7 of Revelation, the 144,000. So while the Jews are being persecuted, God chose 12,000 from each tribe. And these 12,000 or each type, 12 times uh, uh, 12,000 times 12 makes 144,000. So the 144,000 has nothing to do with Christianity, has nothing to do with the church, nor does it talk about only 144,000 are saved. Because there are many saved in the fifth seal. But it has to do with chosen ones who are like the fivefold going out. But these are the 144,000 who work together with the two witnesses, who will be the messengers of God. They were the one challenging the Antichrist, speaking against him, and uh, speaking God's word to his people in a very difficult time. And uh, so these are the 144,000. And uh, then after that, all kinds of things happen. During this seven year period, look at chapter 8. All the, after the seals are broken, there's the seven trumpets. The moment the trumpets sound in chapter 8, in verse 7, uh, it says, uh, One third of the trees are burned up, and all the grass was buried. Second trumpet, one third of the sea, and one third of living creatures in the sea died. A third of the ships are destroyed. Third trumpet, it tells us, uh, uh, all the rivers, a third of the rivers of the spring, every spring, every river affected and poisoned. And then the fourth trumpet, one third of the moon, one third of the stars, one third of the sun, all affected. See, all these are things happening in the seven, seven years. A lot of things happen. Squeeze into seven years. I tell you, if you live in the seven years, it will be like 400 years. Every day something happens. 
Every day, wow, the moon got dark, wow, this happened, wow, that, wow. And then, as if not enough, fifth trumpet, the bottom leaf speed is open. A pollen comes out. And terrible things like take place. Demons and fallen angels that shut up for so long, live up. Six trumpet, the angels at the four, four fallen angels at the river Euphrates release. So imagine the great tribulation, capital G, capital T, is not a vacation time. <laughs> All these things take place, and uh, uh, one third of seas, one third of river, one third of trees, one third of everything. A uh, judgment of God is falling down. And by the time uh, you have uh, all these things happening, uh, in the meantime, what happened to God's people? As the Antichrist rises in the first, first he looks good. And then the abomination of desolation takes place. And um, we see in chapter 12 of Revelation, the people of God. A great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and a moon under her feet and on her head, a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And uh, another sign appeared, and the dragon, of course, represents the devil. He has seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems on his, on his head. He still drew a third of the stars of heaven. So that was in his past. He has, he has fallen, and he drew one third of fallen angels with him. In verse 5, the male child represents Jesus. Now, uh, in the male child represents Jesus, which nation brought forth Jesus? Israel. So the woman represents Israel. Uh, what will Israel do? As the abomination of desolation rises, the dragon who tried to destroy Jesus could not, in verse 4, now goes after the woman. And the woman represents Israel, in verse 6. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. That's what I want to emphasize. I don't want to just give you bad news today. Some of you say, wah, 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 and then you go back. <laughs> right. We want you to know that through all the things, God prepares cities of refuge, countries of refuge, places of refuge. And God prepare in the last three and a half years a place for Israel, somewhere in the wilderness, where His angels will be there. I'm sure Shammah is going to be there, and all that is going to be there, protecting His people. By that time, we are all gone, but Shammah did got a lot of work and all this, protecting his people. And uh, it says here, the woman in verse 6 fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God and they should feed her for 1,260 days. That is the rest of the three and a half years. So in the rest of the three and a half years, God is going to shelter Israel. That's why, that's why Jesus said, when you see, what do you do? Run to the mountain where the angels are waiting for you to shield you. The Antichrist cannot go through. There will be one place that he will, he, will, he will not be allowed to go through. Say, wow, so good. Where's the place today? And there will be a house. Buy a condo there. What for? You don't need it. Rapture already. <laughs> anyway, you know, Singaporeans, they might think about all these things. You know, kiasu. Uh, in case you miss the, tribu- miss the rapture, right? And uh, so, don't worry. There are nations that are refuge for you. This talk about people in Israel. And as, as Pastor David saw, there are countries that are entire refuge. Australia, New Zealand, those are countries of refuge. Far all places. But let me point to why the Certain places, Antichrist never went in. The book of Daniel again. The book of Daniel. Let me take my marker so I don't have to go to and fro too much. Okay. Book of Daniel. When you see uh, places like, uh, let's say, chapter 11 of Daniel. Now we look at chapter 11. And although it talked about the king of the north versus the king of the south, and the king of the north, uh, there's a due fulfillment. It is actually fulfilled in the life of Antiochus Epiphanes, where he actually polluted uh, the very place of worship. And, but that points to the future Antichrist also. And uh, it says here that um, although he has all those things that are magnified, all those things that are mentioned, and all the places that he will enter in chapter 11, 
the strange thing is, although a large part of it is fulfilled in Antiochus Epiphanes in history, some parts was not fulfilled. Some parts point directly to the Antichrist. Uh, for example, in verse 36, chapter 11, Daniel verse 36, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. This is the Antichrist. Shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods. Shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of woman, nor regard any God. For he shall exalt himself above them all. In other words, he will claim to be God. That's the Antichrist. He will come as God. <laughs> right. Maybe he come as an alien first, then become God. <laughs> Whatever. Land on a flying saucer. Whatever. Anyway, uh, the imagination. But in the end, the Bible prophesied he will claim to be God. Actually, it's possible for the alien. You know why? The alien comes forward and says, I seeded this earth. You all are my seed. Eons ago, we came and visit by flying saucers. Our technology is about uh, 5 billion years ahead of you. And whatever, anyway. So we are like gods to you, anyway. But in the end, it says here, uh, all the things that he will do. But then he says in verse 41, He shall enter the glorious land, that is Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown. But, you know this word, but there, but they shall escape from his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. And my friends, those are the places near Madaba. Madaba there. Madaba is near Moab. In the area of, of uh, that's where uh, you were asked to go. And so those places are the wilderness area, which already is prepared to shelter the people of Israel when the Antichrist abomination of desolation come. So those are the various prophecies that are there. Now look at the book of Revelation again. We go back. It talks about the Antichrist rising in chapter 13. Uh, remember that the Antichrist rises primarily during the last week of Daniel. And as the Antichrist rises, it also talks about the false Antichrist, uh, the false prophet rising. There are two beasts, not one beast, in chapter 13. It says in verse 1, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. I noticed that the four creatures that are seen by Daniel also rise out of the sea. So hold your place in uh, chapter 13 of Revelation. In, and as I say again, you need the book of Daniel. <laughs> Go back to the book of Daniel. So, so for those of you with Bible, you just... Chick, chick. For those of you who got screwed... Okay, I don't know. Unless you press your button, right? Your tab. And uh, sometimes when I look for Bible verses, it's faster by physical Bible than by computer. Strange. Uh, some things you can do faster. Anyway, the day will come all you with your iPad Bible and you go... <laughs> Praise the Lord. And then someone invents something else. And um, in the book of Daniel, we find uh, the four uh, beasts in chapter 7. And they are from the sea also. Now this sea represents from a mass of people. From the seas. It says in verse 3, And four great beasts, chapter Daniel chapter 7, verse 3, arise from the sea. The first was like a lion and an eagle's wings. The second was like a bear. And the third, in verse 6, was like a leopard. The fourth was in verse 7, no description, just a horrible looking beast. Now, the four creatures, the first beast is the Babylonian Empire. The second beast, the bear, is the Middle Persian Empire. The third beast is Greece, which is uh, the leopard. The fourth beast, no description, just describe how horrible it is. That is the Roman Empire, the most powerful of them all, and very dreadful, the way you describe it. And... Um, 
Then look at Daniel chapter 8. He has another vision and he saw a small section of this. See, things can change with spiritual vision. And as you look at uh, another vision of a ram and a goat in chapter 8, he says, he looks, and this time notice that it's on land, not from the sea. And he sees uh, in verse 8, I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high. One was higher than the other, the higher one came up last. Uh, one was higher because uh, the Middle Persian Empire, uh, the Medes and the Persians, one was more powerful than the other, although they were combined together. They're like two, two nations combined into one, into one empire, the, Med the Medes and the Persians. And um, it says here, word, chapter 8, verse 4, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him. Now, he is talking again about the Middle Persian Empire. And uh, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. He did according to his will and became great. And Daniel, interestingly, served under two empires. Daniel started his service under Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian Empire. And Daniel served until King Cyrus and uh, Darius the Mede. Those are the Middle Persian Empire. So Daniel served in two empires. Not bad. And the Middle Persian Empire, as you know the story in history, they conquer um, the Babylonian Empire in a very interesting way. On the very night that the Babylonian Empire uh, emperor was using the vessels that were taken from the, from the Holy House of God and using it for normal drinking, a handwriting appeared on the wall. Mena, mena, tekel, yufasin. That's in the book of Daniel. Uh, and, uh, so, they talk about... Uh, 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 how God has, uh, has weighed them, He has judged them, and His, uh, his pun punishment uh, upon them. So Daniel interpreted that. That same night that was interpreted was the same night they fell. Because the Medes and the Persians found a way through some waterway, and they conquered the whole city. And the interesting thing, they used the same capital. At least uh, as a second, secondary part, although they have the Persian, but they use that also as a citadel. And uh, Daniel was able to serve in both. Interesting. And Daniel just said, oh, now he works for a different guy. Employer change. <laughs> Same employee. <laughs> and not bad, this Daniel guy. And so you have this ram is conquering. And then came the good. But look at every description was important. It says here in verse 5. As I was looking, the ram had become great. A male goat came from the west, across the surface of the earth, again from the earth. Usually when from the sea, it talks about a new empire rising from among the people. When they say from the earth, it's usually a creation of some sort of empire from other empires. And, um, and that seems to be the key when I look at the interpretation. Because when Alexander the Great arose, he was not the first king. His father, Philip, was the first king. And, uh, but uh, Macedonia, remember the Macedonians, the Greek. And the Macedonians ruled over the Greek. And uh, there was an agreement between the Macedonians and the Greeks. And uh, his, uh, Alexander was a Macedonian, so was his father. And, uh, but it was Alexander who built it in the conquering empire. But his father, Philip, was the one who did negotiate all those things. And he was murdered. Alexander took over. When Alexander came about, it, he started conquering in verse 5. It became a powerful Greek empire. And it says, The good came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. That is the speed of his conquest. Very fast. And he conquered until all the, his men also tired. They read history. His men, wow, conquer some more. Wow, conquer some more. Wow, conquer some more. But very great speed. He conquered everyone right up to Babylon. And um, then it says here that uh, the goat had not notable horn between his eyes. And um, he came to the ram and had two horns. And of course, in furious power, he confronted that. 
There was no power in the ram to withstand him. He cast him down, trampled him. No one could deliver the ram. Verse 8, The male goat grew very great. When he became strong, the large horn was broken. In place of it, four notable ones came up within the four winds. Indeed, when Alexander died, after he contracted sickness, four of his generals took four divisions of the Greek Empire. They were General Cassander, uh, uh, Lysimachus, Ptolemy and Seleucus. So four of them uh, divided the empire of Alexander the Great and everything fulfilled exactly. In fact, when Alexander was marching into Jerusalem, the high priest was told in a dream to dress up in his full garment like a high priest and brought the scroll of Daniel. And he was standing there waiting to meet Alexander the Great's army marching to Jerusalem. That night, before Alexander went into Jerusalem, he had a dream. In the dream, he saw someone that looked like the high priest waiting for him. And so when he saw it, he was shocked. And when he came to the high priest, the high priest showed him the scroll of Daniel and showed where it prophesied that he will come and conquer. Daniel's scroll. Because of that, Daniel, uh, uh, because of that, Alexander the Great did not destroy Jerusalem. The city was spared. Powerful prophecy. And so all these things were taking place. And uh, so out of that, we, we know where to identify each of these places. Now, hold your place in Daniel. Look back in the book of Revelations. And we see in chapter 13. This chapter 13 is no more here. Chapter 13, remember we are back here. Talking about the Antichrist. So the Antichrist, when he rises up, in verse 2. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, so he got some part of Greek and Greek Empire elements in him. His feet like the feet of a bear, so he got some parts of the Middle Persian Empire. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Wow, try to be Israelite. And uh, then the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. He said, how can the dragon do that? Remember, the same dragon told Jesus. I will give you all these kingdoms and power and authority in the temptation. Jesus said no. Jesus didn't accept it. And so the devil has, through deception, whoever is under his power and authority, he can handle it. So it's all concentrated in one man, the Antichrist. And it says here, the worm marveled and followed him. Now here's the puzzle in verse 3. One of his heads... This beast had seven heads, ten horns. One of his heads was wounded. And uh, everyone said, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war? He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He was given authority to continue for 42 months. Again, three and a half years. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. And it was granted to him, look at verse 7 again, to make war with the saints. So they are still saints. They are saints that he made war against. And, uh, and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names were not written in the book of life. So we have that horrible beast. That is that. Then there comes another beast. Verse 11. Another beast coming from out of the earth. So remember, from the seas are empires that rise from the people. From out of the earth, in my interpretation, there might be other, in my interpretation, is out of the countries upon countries. So here is another beast coming out. A lot of people uh, regard this as a false prophet and just a religious movement. I believe it's more than that. Because to me, beasts always represent empires, kingdoms, nations. And so it says here, Another beast coming out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Now, when did this happen? 
the clue is given in the 42 months. How long were the Antichrist rule? Seven years. Seven years is 84 months, not 42. So 42 months means the beast got this. People forgot when they interpret the Antichrist. Do you notice the word in verse 5, 42 months? 42 months, only three and a half years. Not seven years. So what happened after the other seven years? So what happened is, the Antichrist rise up like a great Messiah political leader, conquer, 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 and then the middle of the 42 months is three and a half years, abomination of desolation. An abomination of desolation takes place. He takes on a religious perspective. Takes on a religious perspective. And then the rest of the three and a half years, this was the other beast. Built on top of the other. See, many times people see them as concurrent. They were only concurrent after the first, something happened to the first beast. It says here in chapter, Revelation chapter 14. He exercised all the authority in verse 12 of the first beast. Now, which first beast is he referring to? That one from the sea. So when did he arise? He must have arisen at the end of the 42. Abomination of desolation. At the end of the 42, he, he somehow is like another empire on top of another empire. And he rise up, he exercised all authority, and this time he probably proclaimed himself as God. That's why now it's different. He, like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. In other words, the lamb rep of course represents Jesus. He really takes his place as the real God. And some will worship him, some, some may not. And it says here, and uh, this time he's given a new plot of power. It says in verse 12, He caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Ah, so empire upon empire. So you realize here that uh, that's why some people look at the beast as two different people. It could be two different people, but within empire upon empires. And as you know, God is not so particular about different various people. Like even the uh, Babylonian Empire and even Alexander the Great, when, when you look at it, you realize that uh, the horn logically should have represent Philip the first king. Uh, Macedonia and, and Greek, but it represented Alexander. Alexander was the one that he prophesied about. And so here in the same way, you have uh, the rise within the two. And here are the possible interpretation. You could they interpret the beast and uh, the beast from the sea and the beast from the from the earth as two different people, like traditional interpretation. There's a false prophet and there was an the antichrist. Or you could interpret that it could be one person, he mocked higher and higher, and he changed. He adapt himself. He could be like, for example, the president of Euro, become president of the United States at the same time, take on more and more things. Or he could be uh, a political leader, suddenly become religious leader also. And so he takes on more and more things. It could be one person mocked into two, and he says, now you shall worship this image. Remember, the worship was concentrated on the image. The image is different from the beast. I will point that out afterwards. And, um, or, you could imagine that it might be someone who is like a Philip before Alexander, who is used by the Antichrist, and uh, then uh, proto-Antichrist, then come out the real Antichrist, who is more devilish than before. Many, many possible interpretations. I won't limit you to any uh, as far as the concern. But here the Bible did talk about a two-phase, three and a half years. First phase, beast from the land, uh, sea. Second phase, beast from the sea. And um, it says here, he exercised all the authority of the first beast. So he inherited all his power. And causes the earth and those who dwell it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs Great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. He deceived those who dwell on the earth by signs. He was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth 
to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, whatever the word image represents. The image of the beast should both speak, cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich, poor and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand on, on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has marked the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. His number is 666. Let him understand the number of the beast is the number of men. His number is 666. Now, all those things that we predict of the Antichrist is actually caused by this second beast. The mark, the image, the signs, everything. But he's using the other beast. So if both beasts represent nations and empire, then you could imagine a lot of manipulation up there. He changed... A nation. Remember, he, the first beast already unite the whole earth, every tribe. And then now, the, the main difference between these two beasts is worship. Worship has now come into play. And I will say at some point during the abomination of desolation, at this point, the earth worship another God. Because worship always had to do with God. In the first part, it could be a conqueror. At this point, the earth now recognizes him as a god. But it's very clever. He shows this image as God, or direct representation of God, in some manner. And we do not know the details of some of this interpretation, but we do know that each phrase means something. Just like the one phrase where the goat does not touch the earth, but move rapidly means he conquer very fast. Each phrase means something. Now, that is as much as we go here. And uh, then, I have to point also at chapter 17. There was this woman sitting on this beast. And... Uh, the scarlet woman and the scarlet beast are all that different characters playing each other. You say, how do we know? Because in chapter 17, you have this woman in purple seated over this beast and the woman on the forehead got this name. The forehead of the woman say, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So this woman points back all the way to Babylonian Empire here. You notice how he keeps jumping. That's why I put all these maps here. So from there, it points to Mystery Babylon. That means the very root of all empires, Mystery Babylon. The mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. Now, she has drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. I saw her and I marveled, John the Apostle says. He marveled. And then the angel says, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman. Say, wow, 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 we want to know the mystery of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. And then he says in verse 8, The beast you saw was not, is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. You say, what beast? He suddenly, do you see it? Many scholars forgot this interpretation. It says, the beast. You see, the word beast is not consistently applied to the original beast that came from the earth. Because now the beast, and this is the beast that the woman is sitting on, that seems to be the same guy. Because why? If the, if the first beast got seven heads, ten horns, second beast, seven heads, ten horns, third beast, seven heads, ten horns, don't you think the same one? They all look like either triplets or <laughs> something like that. They look slightly different, but all got seven heads, ten horns. Wouldn't you think, hey, sama, sama. And let's look at it this way. Uh, Daniel, when he interpret the four beasts, right? Uh, uh, the, the, the first beast, uh, that was uh, uh, the horrible looking beast. And then there, there was the, the one that uh, had the bear, and then the leopard, and all those things. Now, later on, the leopard was the goat. Wasn't it the Greece Empire was the good that conquered 
the one that looked like a bear, that the bear now looks like a ram. But are we talking about the same thing? Sama sama. So the same bear was the ram. The same um, leopard was the goat. All sama sama. Slightly changed but different. It talks about two angles from two different angles. Which is why I propose to you, it is possible that the beast that rise up from the, from the sea, the beast that rise up from, from the um, land, are in a sense of that interpretation. Just a slight twist. But do you notice what was important? This abomination of desolation. The one right in the middle, here. Something took place here. And uh, anyway, let's go back to chapter 17, verse 8. It says, The beast that you saw was not and is not will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life. Then in verse 10, There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is the other has not yet come. When he comes, he must continue a short time. Now this is easy interpretation because of so much scholarly work that is done. We realize that there were various empires and um, Daniel, uh, or rather uh, this um, John the Apostle was in the Roman Empire which is here. So John was here in the Roman Empire that continued and during John's time, he says, as he received the book of Revelation, he says, there are seven kings. Five have fallen. So you count one, you know, you, you count one, two, three, eh? Hey, got five fallen, only three empires before. Then you realize, before the Babylonian Empire, when you count empires based on Israel, which empire has, con has conquered, dominated Israel, you realize that there were two somewhere in their past. One was, as you say, the Assyrian Empire that is there. And so here is John. Let's look at John here. He says, there are seven kings. And he says, five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And... Uh, so, you count the various empires that have fallen. If you count the Syrian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, and then plus the Babylonian, Middle Persian, Greece, then you got five behind them. He's in the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, he says, you are existing now. One is the last one for a short time. Which is correct. From this short time, ignoring our 2,000 years here, this short time is very short. Where the last beast will come out, who will be number seven. Number seven. And he will rise out. And then here's the puzzle that he continued. He says in verse the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who receive no kingdom yet. But they will receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And the power and authority to the beast, they will make war with the lamb. The lamb will over, uh, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord King of Kings. Of course, Jesus overcomes everything. But uh, as they exercise all these uh, authorities and powers that are there, look at chapter 17, verse 11. The beast that was and is not, because all these empires are the demonic realm, is himself also the eight. Is it eight? Eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Is himself also the eight. Yeah. That is where remember what I told you happened in the middle. The beast, the beast from the sea is number seven. The beast from the land is number eight. They all have some sort of relationship 
which we have separated into two persons, the false prophet and the, and the false uh, antichrist. But sometimes we get blurred because these things are not just one person. They're talking about empires, nations. And, uh, but the other interesting thing is that this beast is described as coming out of the bottomless pit. Neither of the beasts from the earth or from the from the earth or from the sea was coming out of a bottomless pit. The only bottomless pit beast that I know is the one that is described when the seal was broken in chapter nine. And this is Apollyon. Apollyon. And you, you see here in chapter nine, in verse eleven and twelve. Uh, we are in Revelation still, <laughs> chapter 10, verse 11 and 12. They had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, in Greek his name is Apollyon. So Apollyon will rise up from the bottomless pit and he will be the spiritual king behind the beast of their rise on the earth. So as they rise up, while the physical human who becomes like the Antichrist will rule and reign, there is a fallen angel right with him. Of course, Satan is with him. But there's all this. And don't forget, this is a very horrible creature who is locked up in the bottomless pit. But this bottomless pit will struggle against the 444,000 and the two witnesses. So imagine when the enemy comes, Elijah called on fire. Shoom! So, first three and a half years, very hard. Very hard. They got opposition from the two witnesses and 144,000. Until chapter 11, who defeated the two witnesses? That is the beast from the bottomless pit. Same beast in chapter 11, verse 7. The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and God allow them to overcome. So he literally kills Elijah and he not for three and a half days their bodies lay there. So we cannot imagine what kind of battle takes place. It will be natural and spiritual at the same time. Whoa, this is Star Wars all over again. Worse. And when did this occur? When did the beast succeed? in the middle. Again, this spot. You see this timing? Now, only when the beast succeeds at this point, then there's a change over. Because now the bottomless speed fallen angel rules unhindered together with Satan. The bottomless fallen angel is probably like the commander-in-chief of Satan's army. That is now locked up because the military leader is, a, is the one that needs to be locked up. Right now, he's locked up. Otherwise, the earth got no peace. And though he's there with Satan, the other fallen angel, there's the Antichrist, and there they are ruling. You see how short their rule, limited to three and a half years over there. And what was God doing? He was protecting, providing protection for the Israelites. They still cannot cross. Where God draws the boundary, they cannot cross the boundary. Now, how does all these things now relate back to us? Now, let me see. We all This part is all in our history. Roman Empire is in our past history. This part is in the future. We are here in a 2000 year period. Pastor David saw two spiders. That's why I want to refresh our new understanding. Pastor David saw two spiders. Spiders have eight legs. One spider uh, had one leg almost broken. Or rather, he got only seven legs. Broken. Already broken. Uh, broken. <laughs> so one leg cannot walk properly. The other spider, spiny one, got all eight legs. And so there are these two spiders he saw. My interpretation of the spider is the first spider, because he saw it, it was more European sector. The first spider represents the European sector. The second spider he saw was over the Middle Eastern area and then shook 
he went uh, in his vision, he saw it go into Saudi Arabia and nest there. What is happening here? The Roman Empire has fallen. We are in the period just before the ten, ten horns and the Antichrist arising. And at this point, let's look at the book of Revelations again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Revelation is putting everything together. Something is interesting. You thought that the woman sitting on top of the beast with the ten horns all are united together. And all, you know, they're singing merrily the scout song. The more we get together, 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 more we get together, the happier we'll be. For my friends are your friends and your friends are my friends. Whatever. So you thought they're all friends together. Uh, but no. They're quarreling among themselves. Chapter 18. Look at what happened to the woman and what happened to the beast and what happened to the ten horns. We see here in chapter 18, Revelation, we are now in Revelation chapter 18. It says here, in verse 2, there was a cry, Baby Lord, the grave is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean hated bird. All the nations had drunk of the wine and of the wrath of a fornication. Kings of the earth had committed fornication. We heard that merchants of the earth had become rich through the abundance of a luxury. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sin, lest you receive her plagues, for her sins have reached to heaven. God has remembered her iniquities. And uh, remember, she was drinking the blood of saints. So I assume that the woman riding the beast was all the remnants of the world empire flowing along with the beast here. But it reached a climax. There was a climax. It says here in verse 9. At one point, Babylon fell. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and luxuriously will weep and lament for her. And all the other things are mentioned uh, in long lament. It says in verse uh, 17. For in one hour... Such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the seas. So they lament, they cry over her. And then um, in um, chapter 19, chapter 19, it tells us here, <clears throat> as it continues, uh, the lament that they have over her life, the beasts in the end are defeated by Jesus finally coming. And Jesus coming is right at the end in chapter 19 here uh, when Jesus comes and he comes against all of the beasts that is there. So Jesus in Revelation 19 appears in verse 16. Let's examine uh, this area of uh, chapter 18 very carefully. It does say here, in regard to uh, these people, and, uh, or rather these uh, ten horns, in chapter 17, verse 16, you see something about how they coordinate with one another. The ten horns which you saw on the bees, they will hate the harlot. Hey, that's strange, isn't it? The horns hate the harlot. And make her desolate, naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Ah, so here is the puzzle. Who is this woman? Who is she? According to the Bible, she exists in our time. And she will exist in uh, some form or shape in the middle of the tribulation and in the last week and just as this antichrist rises who is the one who brought her down not christ christ came in chapter 19 defeat everyone who defeated this woman the ten horns in your bible ten horns it says in verse 16 although they benefit they war with her. Says it was 16. Look at the word. The key is one hour. 
See, the one hour helps you to interpret in verse... Uh, when did the ten kings rise? In verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which receive no kingdom as yet. They receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So, until the beast come, they cannot come. When the beast come, they came. Why? They are allies with the beast. Later on, the beast, of course, conquered three of them, rule. But they were allies with the beast. They came with the beast. So, among these three, the ten horns, the beast, which is the seven heads, and the woman, the beast and the ten horns are allies. But this woman is different. Now, when was this woman defeated? It says here, in chapter 18, verse 17. Here's your key. In one hour, your great riches came to nothing. So at the time that the beast rose, and these ten allies helped to bring about Babylon to nothing, and they in fact rule over Babylon, which implies that this woman, whose fullness rich is horror, under Antichrist, because this woman represents also uh, Antichrist, part of Antichrist influence uh, in the world. But this woman was actually defeated, strangely, by the beast and the ten horn, uh, and the ten horn one hour. One hour prophetically. Our timeline is this. It's easy to roughly measure the timeline. Because if... Um, how you measure uh, in terms of uh, prophetic time uh, that is there, that is a very, very short time. But in a very short time, all that represent that is Babylon. And when you read the episodes, you realize they talk about the mystery of lawlessness that is already at work. This is why I believe that the woman represents all of the empires in essence. And the worst lot comes to there. And all that's what that this, this woman represents that, that continuing to buy and sell and all the riches of the world and all this corruption that is there. That finally, when the ten horns arise and take over with the beast, they see some destruction. Whether this Babylon represents some people believe it represents America. It could be, in the future, a prosperous Europe. Whatever that was. But it represents the pinnacle or the capital of the world trade and commerce that the world depends on. Conquered by the ten horns with the beast. That's where we live before the beginning of the first week. Here's where it's important to us. We live before that. And so before all those things, we, are, we live in a time of the prosperity of the British Empire, the prosperity of the American Empire or influence, and we are seeing the rise of the European Empire. We are living, seeing this uh, influence of the world changing. We are in the midst of a great change uh, at the moment. And so here we are in this time, and then we are told, that there are two fallen angels locked under ice and snow somewhere in Siberia <laughs> and they will be released not during the week but here in our end times that's why in our end times we need more help from the angels and from the anointing of the Holy Spirit they are released not there but here during our dispensation at the end of this 2,000 years period. And they are released, their names are sorcery, seduction. And they have been locked up since the days of Noah, Enoch. So the world has never seen the evil that they will do. When they are released, imagine how much unity the, the demon, demonic and sin man God. All will come under them because they are so powerful. All the smaller demons that want to fight among each other, all will unite under them because they will just whip the whip and all the demons that are under them, all the line up under their authority. They are there and, and they are in our dispensation. That is there. That we will have to face and that we will confront. 
Of course, now some of you say, Praise the Lord. I need to give you good news. <laughs> okay, you said, 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 after, you know, you lost your appetite for your dinner. <laughs> Say, wow, all this happened. Better fast another 40 days. <laughs> I, with all those things happening, we realize through all this coming and going, comings and going, all the wild angels are in charge. They control when a nation can come, when a nation shall rise, when a nation time is up. You can see that even in Daniel's time, they were controlling when a nation can come, when a nation can go. Now, if you have your thumbs again in the book of Daniel, go back to the book of Daniel, and it says there in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, and verse, uh, verse 1, and, and verse 2, Gabriel told Daniel, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. So who helped to make uh, Darius king? Gabriel was behind working the scene. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than all. By his strength through his riches, he has stir up against the realm of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. So all these angels know the rise and fall of various powers. And look at the Daniel chapter 10, in verse 20. Now we know that Gabriel, when he came to uh, Daniel, he was wrestling with the uh, prince of Persia, which is a fallen uh, angel. And then uh, uh, Michael came to help, and then he continued on. But look at what happened after. It says in chapter 10, verse 20. Do you know why I have come to you? He says, and now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia when I have come for, when I have gone for, the prince of Greece will come. And they say, hey, what is this? Come, one go, one come, one come, one go. No, we are all very confused now in prophecy. You know, you come, you go, you come, you go. Here's another one. And the prince of Greece come. Who is the prince of Greece? Ah, you can see that they are holding back each empire. And how the Greece, you know, here's the middle position, here's the Greece. The Greeks want to come all the time. Want to come out. And then between the Medes and the Persian, the Medes have to rise for a moment and Persians wait. And so even then, the equilibrium is held by the angels. And uh, making sure, holding back Persia. And uh, so Persia might want to wipe out the Greeks completely. But Greece had their destiny. So they might hold back the Persians for a while. And then uh, Greece allowed to dominate. You notice that when he has gone to fight with the Persians, the Greeks start rising. So angels are involved in the rise and fall of empires, making sure they line up according to God's timetable. And in the same way, with all that, whatever God released, whatever God don't release. And when Pastor David asked uh, roughly when, when, when these two fallen angels are going to be released, he says, very soon. <laughs> no. oh, thank you. <laughs> How soon we must ask Tao soon? Who might know he's a he's a very clever man. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and so <laughs> okay, but uh, according to uh, and then the later Shama revealed that it will be your timeline and my timeline when it match. Now, although our timeline match uh, around between uh, uh, two zero uh, one six to two zero two five. Where the place starts coincide, where the timelines end completely, is 2025 20, to 2026. And uh, so, mine is 10 years, 10 years, is 13 years cycle. We both have cycles. Now, my next cycle begins in 2016 and ends in 2026. Your cycle begins this year and ends in 2025. And in my understanding, more, probably, during the years 2025-2026, those are really critical years of the changeover. Where if you hear something happen in Siberia <laughs> or whatever it is, then you know, oh, right? That's, uh, uh, you can hear something. But that's my interpretation, subjective, where we actually cross. But uh, we give an overall period. 
that during the period, even from now these two years preparing for the revival, and with the revival coming forth, uh, two years, yeah, uh, two years, you some way worried, yeah, okay, <laughs> and during uh, two years preparing, two years, two years, two years, uh, no need to calculate the Lord said, and then so we have here the two years preparation, and then we have this uh, coincidence where we, where I believe, uh, doesn't mean that the revival will wait till then. The revival is already happening. The anointing of God is going stronger. And then there will day a come when the spirit beings will manifest. And when God sent us out, okay, now it's time to go forth. And uh, uh, angels begin to manifest and do things. We realize all those things. And when you look at the whole thing, we human beings are like tiny little puppets in all between the big events happening. And we need to know our time and the seasons of our time. Definitely, it says, the enemy has no power over the people of God unless God gave permission. As you saw, the Antichrist was given permission. And that is only take place after that. Now back to where we are today, in the book of Thessalonians. Now we go to Thessalonians. And we realize that, um, in fact, you know, uh, the, it's good to know the time factor in God because we cannot underestimate and be overconfident, even though we know we are authority in Christ, to think of our preparedness. And God in His mercy probably see the timeline. The angels right now, one of the archangels is holding back these two fallen angels because He knows whether the church is ready or not. I believe when He sends the readiness of the church to be able to confront sorcery, confront seduction, openly from the enemy forces, then I believe. Then he say, okay, I think the, they are strong enough. Okay, now you can go. <laughs> so they are holding back for the sake of the church. In the book of 2 Thessalonians, um, 2 Thessalonians, praise the Lord. Chapter 2, in verse 3 onwards, it says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exhausts himself against all who is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still here, I told you these things, that Paul says, Now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Last week I say, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do until he's taken out of the way. So I believe that he who restrains represents the church working together with the Holy Spirit. And through our prayers, through our walk with God, through our purpose, and with the angels of God who are alongside working with us, restraining lawlessness and bringing this revival to the fullness that God wants us to be. Although we are not in the Great Tribulation, I point here to the book of Revelations. There are four things that they have to come against. People ask, what is the image and what is the mark? We do not know yet and we don't want to speculate. But we know the essence of what it talks about. Because in Revelation chapter 15, it says in verse 2, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those were the victory. And the victory over four things, not one thing. Victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name. Do you know the word over four times? Four different areas of victory. Now the beast, as we know, is tied to the bottomless pit also. So they have victory over the spiritual forces. The beast, which particularly mentioned two times, three times, linked to the bottomless pit, which is Apollyon, the king over all these... Uh, uh, forces of the enemy locked in the bottomless pit. So, also over the Antichrist. So, over the beast, over his image. Now, the image, we don't know what it is, it has to do with worship. The beast, the two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon, forced people to worship the image of the first beast. It has to do with worship. Which means that whatever the image represents is something that people give worship to. In other words, it would make say, this is your God, and then everyone would worship. And because we humans have modernized, 
it might mean something different in our modern age. And uh, whether it is some sort of um, uh, uh, deity that is created, some sort of thing, which is why it can look still like two persons but actually controlled by the same evil spirits. And uh, that is uh, race. Whatever this image has to do, it has to do with how important our worship is. And God is so stringent. In the tribulation, it says, anyone who got the mark, shoom, go into the hell of lake of fire. And that is the third thing. The overcome the mark. Not easy. And not just the rich have the mark. It says, the rich, the poor. Everyone had the mark in verse 16. Chapter 13, verse 16, Revelation. Small and great. So the small school student right up to the king. Why? Because the beast already ruled the earth. He can command everything. Every tribe, every time. Small and great. Rich and poor. So the richest billionaire or mark. And the poor guy who cannot afford his next meal also mark. <laughs> and the Bible says anyone who got that mark cannot go into heaven. So, so it's not just like simple thing that we imagine. Eh? There is some simple thing to do with a computer chip. Could be more complex than that. And there's something of evil that is imparted. Why is that so? Remember the woman got thing written on the forehead. And then we got the spiritual mark today where uh, God marked all the 144,000. And in the book Ezekiel chapter 9, uh, in a war that is predicted by Ezekiel, God says he marked those to be killed, marked those to be spared. Some sort of mark. At the beginning of the book of Revelations, and the first seal and second seal and third seal all broken, God says, do not touch the oil or the wine. Oil and wine represent the people of God. We have a mark on us. So God puts a mark on us and a spiritual mark. So it might not just be something kind of, it might be physical with some spiritual element. That's why God says, hey, if you take it, you're demonized or something like that. Okay, you're not of me. And so there's a mark, the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the free and the slave. They receive a mark either on their right hand or on their foreheads. And they have to resist and overcome the beast, the image, the mark, and the number of his name. As if his num number is getting got some sort of power. Because by that stage, remember this, sorcery, devil is involved. You do not know one small little thing what is the demons behind it. And you can imagine it is all amplified, locked into these last seven years. Thank God we are not there, but here where we are. How do we continue walking with God? How do we walk righteously? And how do we anticipate the end time and this great revival that we will see? Where we will work side by side. And here you can understand why God works side by side for us. Or with us. Because during the tribulation, there is no greatness demonstrated except by the two witnesses, the 144,000, and Jesus at the end of the seventh week. God is not going to show His people weak and puny and tiny. At which point in history will God show how great He is with His people? Our time. People who belong to Christ, the same Christ who will conquer the Antichrist. During the tribulation, God permitted short period, okay, now, you know, those, this, at the end of a message. And I always see the same pattern. Every place where Paul has preached the gospel, you look where they are today. They are not Christian countries even. Because every time where God succeeded, the enemy follow to try to remove. And the same way, the good news is, we will see the greatest period of revival ever. Whoever lived before this time is privileged. So don't be horrified. Say, oh, wah, wah, wah. We will see the height, the glory of all that has never been seen before. What was hidden even from the ages before is revealed in Ephesians 3 to this time. 
And just as the Antichrist worked closely with the fallen angel, Apollyon, and all those things, we will work closely with Shama, commander of the Lord's army, Michael the archangel, Gabriel. And we will work closely, of course, with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is still a commander in chief. But what a privilege we have. What a privilege. And think about that. Why God is doing what He did. Now, about the spiders. Say, what spiders? I've forgotten it. Okay, okay. He saw, and one spider represents Europe. Because the Roman Empire consists of Europe and the Middle East. Europe and the Middle East. It is not. So the EEC and the European Union today is all only Europe. They don't even want to let Turkey in. But the Roman Empire in the past consists of Europe all the way to Israel and the Middle East and Egypt. Today, those two sections are like two different cultures. One of the spiders represents the European sector of the, mid, of the revised Roman Empire, of the Roman Empire. The other spider represents the Middle Eastern section. And the one that is uh, in the European sector, one of them with the broken leg, they represent most likely the eight strongest nations in Europe. And you know how it is even in the European Union right now. You may have many countries, 20 over countries, but the f- only two or three very powerful. And influence the rest. Say, I don't lend you money. Oh, finish. Bankrupt. So they're very powerful. Only two, three very powerful. Altogether, there are eight powerful countries in Europe. But one of them has been weakened. I believe the broken leg is Greece. <laughs> you know why? Why is Greece so important? Greece was a great power. It was an empire. For it to be shown as a broken leg, I mean, why would not God show it as like, say, Sweden, Switzerland, Norway, those got no prophetic significance. But Greece has always got prophetic significance. Don't forget, the Antichrist got leopard things. Greece has been broken in our time. One leg broken. So his prophecy is current. So only eight strong nations in Europe today. We have a list of the eight possible, eight potential nations. And in the Middle East, the spider still got eight legs. Spider's headquarters in Saudi Arabia. You know what it is. All the countries that are there, still strong. Now what will happen? This Eight countries, those seven countries left, will somehow mingle, merge, mingle, merge, mingle, merge, until left. Ten horns with the woman represent Babylon. So a lot of things still have to happen until as we go closer and closer and closer and closer to the time, we will see Ten strong countries. Behind it, will, behind one of the horns will be Antichrist. So they will, they will ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. We'll see a lot of ding dongs. Let the spiders fight, <laughs> whatever. Ding dong, ding dong. And they will ding dong until left ten very strong ones. And as the ten strong ones are in the background, because all the time it looked like the woman is the key. See, the woman is the empire that continue all right on. Until the right time, the ten horns with the beast will overthrow the woman. <coughs> Destroy, devour her flesh. And then the world will cry. Ah! In that one hour. Whatever that one hour represents prophetically. And then there will be the rise of the beast. Powered by the bottomless speed beast. Rising with the ten horns. Somewhere along the line, he conquered the three horns. So we realize where the timing is and where we are today, prophetically. We are indeed in the last days. And prophetically, you know, things are happening that we cannot imagine. 
the predictions in his prophecy and uh, that is not in the latest panorama but the previous write-up that we have where we have given details on the website and blog and you talk you know there's predictions of war that it will take place uh, in Europe and all those things are happening so when you see all those things happening remember it's not because the angels are lost control they are right now preventing it and all the 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 Asian countries that he saw, he was at the edge of, uh, you were at the edge looking over at China, Japan, and Korea, and you were praying, and he has this vision. He saw the vision of this creature. The first thing was a monkey, a raccoon monkey. Raccoon got very cute eyes, and black color, but raccoon that looks like monkey. And then, uh, then what was the other creature? Tortoise, correct. And then what he saw, as he described clearly, was um, this uh, uh, raccoon monkey, this tortoise, something happened to the tortoise, and then the phoenix came, choom, on the raccoon monkey, and then uh, after that, the li- uh, 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 a tiger came and choom, hold back the tail of the phoenix. The phoenix came, choom, choom, so one after the other. Must be very nice vision, you know, like... You know, don't know got sign sign effects or not. You can zoom, zoom, zoom. You right? Three, three D effect and you know, the sound and the Dolby sound. <laughs> zoom, zoom, zoom effect. And uh, so we interpreted this. And um, the tiger is China, Phoenix is Japan, the tortoise and the raccoon. The tortoise is North Korea, raccoon is South Korea. And then as all these zoom zoom come, you saw the arrows that came, and then wounded. All those things. Those are the arrows he shot earlier from uh, the area of Taitira and Pergamos. And the kings of the east, which are in the book of Revelations, although now we look like Asia rising, 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 there will always be things that stop it from becoming too powerful. Not because it could not be powerful. Nothing to do with culture, nothing to do with Asian or anything. Because of God's end time plan that he has. As you know, the Mongol Empire, shun, they want to conquer, they can conquer. It's because God did not allow any other powers to arise, preventing. And even in the West, so many powers want to rise. And it's not so much that they cannot, but God prevent and God only allow whosoever fulfill that plan that He has. The angels are in charge, all those plans. And so here we are living and we're seeing all these changes that are happening. Changes that are happening. Never have you seen a time when great empires, uh, once upon a time, powerful countries, become powerless. Greek was an empire. Look at where it is. And look at where we are today. Where Iraq is today, the four angels are locked up there. Somewhere in the Euphrates, the area. And it's Babylon is really not that strong there. And so we live in a time where things have changed. And there's a lot more changes to come. But what we are concerned is, what do we do in our time? The four things very important there is important here. That we worship only God. And, and any image, uh, John writes, beware of idols. So anything that takes first place of our love from God must be watched. So there doesn't be an image in our life. And in terms of the mark of the beast, it has to do with commerce and money. Our relationship to money, to success, the things of the world. Never let it deceive you. In fact, um, uh, deception. The main deception in the Bible mentioned, uh, when the seed is sown into foreground, the ground that is among thorns is the deceitfulness of riches. Draw away the energy of people away into the thorns and they got no energy for God. So we must focus. Thank God for God will supply, God will prosper us, God will supply more than enough millions, billions of dollars, whatever is necessary for the end time. But we must remember we are not here for food, clothing, or shelter. Those are added unto us. We are not here, you know, to just enjoy the luxuries. We thank God for whatever He lets us enjoy. But we are here with a purpose. To serve God, do His work, do His will, establish the kingdom of God. To create things where people can hear the gospel, people can hear the word, and most of all, people can grow spiritually. As long as people grow spiritually, we have done our part to help people grow. And 
we are called to the end time re revival. What a privilege. See, there is no other opportunity. You know, God has to show the greatest that He can do among His people. Quote unquote, John, the, John G. Lake called it the God man. He called that. People who are yielded to God, who walk on earth like Jesus, do the works of Jesus, greater works of Jesus. The God man, he called them. This is your only opportunity in this end time. And really, God has a great plan for those who walk with God in these last days. Because if you have lived 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago and you walk with God closely, He will still reward. But you won't have the outward rewards that He can demonstrate of His greatness, of His demonstration of His power. So we love God and we walk with God in these last days. It is our privilege to taste of these end time things and the greatness of God's power among us. So let's, as we look at the end time, know where we are. And even more, the urgent call goes out. These are not times to play, play around again. And to go slow. The destinies and the time. If my timeline and his timeline merge, that is also not very far. Some of you say, wow, thank you, uh, 22025. Two, 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 very far, you know. I still. Uh, some of you might say, "Don't know, I'm still alive or not." You know, <laughs> so I eat, drink, and be merry and die early, whatever. But time passed very fast. Time passed very fast, and not just concerned about you, your children, your children's children. We have to leave something for the next generation. Even if some of us don't live long enough to see the next generation, if everything there is. You want to leave behind enough spiritual resources and endowment and power to the next generation. Because the battle that they're going to face is greater and greater against the darkness of this age. But I definitely know that these two fallen angels released are in our lifetime. Which means thank God for the grace that He will show in our time. Let's be prayerful. Let's thank God for the privilege. Be warned about where we are today and the many things that God is revealing. That God will continue to break the legs of the spiders until when in total you don't have 16 legs, you have 10 legs. Then we have to watch. Because things that are impossible can just happen in these end times that we never dreamed could happen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy upon our lives. We thank you, Lord, that as we look at the end time and put all the scriptures together, we know, Lord, the end time has been something that is planned even from thousands of years ago. You foresaw all these things, Father. You know every detail of every plan, of every skirmish, skirmish and every battle. Whether the battles are physical battles or whether they are spiritual battles or whether they are commerce battles or social battles, you have foreseen all these details. And you have seen what the world will be like of today. And you know the hearts of men today. And Father, you have called us to be a people of prayer, a people of praise, a people of worship. And we pray, Father God, that in these end times, that you will establish us in that which you have for us. It is a privilege, Father, but it is an awesome responsibility to know the times that we live in and it would be negligent of us if we become careless. So, Father, we want to watch and pray. We want to be diligent. We want to enter into that and most of all, the warning that was given last week that those who are not diligent might not enter the marriage supper of the Lamb and they will go through the tribulation. Even more, Father, in this end time, we want to be counted worthy of the resurrection. Worthy of God of this great time when you rapture us and when the Spirit create a new resurrected body. Thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy upon our life and cause understanding, wisdom, and a sense of awesomeness that we are face to face with the living God to come upon our lives. 
we thank you, praise you, and worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Let's all rise together. We sing, He is Lord. Because no matter how much the enemy does, Jesus is always Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And He is Lord. Every shall bow every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord you are Lord you are Lord you are Lord You are risen from the dead And you are Lord Every knee shall bow Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. Now the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you peace and favour. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap offering. God bless each one of you.